fascinated by what he said. I was scared of him at first, because if you Google Tommy Robinson, you get all the bad stuff. He's a racist, he's a criminal, he's islamophobe, he's all. If, if you were to judge Tommy Robinson but by what the mainstream media said about him, you would never want to meet him, let alone talk with him. Um, I remember my first interview with him. I just asked him, paint point blank, are you, are you a racist? What do you think about the Jews? I just, you know, why not just put the questions to the man? And his answers were excellent. They were liberal. They were normal. In fact, they're very, people call Tommy a racist. It's a lie. The first time I met Tommy when I flew to England one day, he was there with his longtime childhood friend who happens to be black. Just happens to be. One of the reasons Tommy left the English Defense League is that it was starting to attract racists, and Tommy wouldn't abide that. Uh, I found a man who, although he speaks with a working class accent and never had the opportunity to go to Oxford, is certainly clever enough to have done so had he had the opportunity. And what he may lack in formal education, he makes up for with courage and a patriotism and a care and I talked earlier about the forgotten people. And the, the issue that motivates and animates Tommy more than most are these systematic rape gangs in the UK. And I'm going to have a heavy talk for about three minutes. What is a rape gang? And I, and I know some of you who watch my show know. But I just want to say it for those who don't. Uh, in North America, rape is a horrific crime. But it is a, a crime, I imagine, of someone hiding in the bushes and jumping out of a woman walking at night and, and it's a solitary crime and, and if a woman were to shout help I'm being raped the response by anyone with an earshot would be to help or call for help. That is not what rape gangs in the United Kingdom do. Rape gangs in the United Kingdom work as gangs because in Canada if a man were to help hear help by being raped a man would get help. But in these rape gangs the men collude and work together and join in the rape. I think that's an essential difference between the occasional shocking crime of rape in North America and the systemic industrial scale of cooperative systemic perpetual rape in the United Kingdom, which targets young women, almost exclusively indigenous white British girls, also Sikh girls, and almost exclusively the rapists are Muslim men often from Pakistan. The trial that Tommy was covering in Leeds last Friday had 29 defendants, 27 men, two women, and they worked as a team. And they would rape girls as young as 11 years old. So these were children. And it would start off a young girl, uh, an older man, saying, oh, would you like a drink? Would you like a cigarette? Would you like a beer? Would you like something dangerous? Would you like candy even? Would you like a boyfriend? Your mom said you can't have one, you're too young, but you're grown up enough. Would you like to kiss me? And it's an entrapment. And then you get a photo, a sext, something, ah, and now you've got them. Because you have proof that they did something wrong. You sent me a, a topless selfie. And now, I, and now if you don't do this, 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 and this for me, I will show your mother what you and you will embarrass your whole family. Or I will now burn down your mother's house because I know where you live. So now sleep with me. Well, now you sleep with me. I will tell your mother unless you sleep with my friends. And so it's, they use the word grooming gang, but I hate the word grooming because it sounds something positive. He's well groomed. The groom in this case is to exploit them, psychologically extort them, trap them, lock them in. Now, it was very soon that this systematic exploitation was detected. For example, in the city of Rotherham, UK, a city of 250,000 people. That's a small city, isn't it? 1,400 girls. 1,400 girls in a city of just 250,000. And those are just the girls who came forward. There's only 125,000 females in a population of 250,000. How many are aged, how many are infants, that was such a spectacularly high percentage in Rotherham, everybody knew, everybody had to know. 
But those five key professionals I talked about before, the press, the politicians, the police, the prosecutors, the professors, add in some more, the frontline social workers, the hospitals, the child care, the child protection agencies, they all knew, but they kept it a secret for fear of being called racist. They would rather have rapists than to be called racists. And finally, when this was finally exposed, there's an enormous inquiry, you can find it quickly online, search Rotherham, that's the name of the city, R-O-T-H-E-R-H-A-M. And if you, it's a huge document, you can use the find feature to find the word racist. Again and again, police, doctors, social services workers said, I didn't want to speak out because I didn't want anyone to call me racist. Women would drag their child out of it, out of a rape house, often chicken shops or a shop, to the police and say, go and, go and prosecute those men. I've taken her straight out of the room. Well, you shut up about this miserable to prosecute you for child neglect and allowing your child to be drunk and drugged. Sometimes men would go to give justice themselves. They would be arrested and thrown in jail. I told you that happened to Chelsea Wright of Sunderland. When the police did nothing, her brother did, and he was sent to prison. So this is on such a scale, you have no idea. It, because it's not, in our culture, help, rape. Men come to help in rather rape, and then they join in, and it's a gang, they call it a gang. This disturbs Tommy to no end, and Tommy has made this his issue because the 5P professionals have abandoned the field, and they call anyone who complains about that right wing. I tell you again, I've seen Tommy's people. They vote Labour. <laughs> They're not right wing. They're a little bit socialist, actually. Uh, they're not racist. They just don't want the, the girls of their community to be raped. That's really what motivates Tommy. That's the number one. If that issue were not a fact in, in the United Kingdom, Tommy would be, well, <clears throat> doing home rentals. That's what he was doing when I found him. And I, he was so powerful, I said, what do you do for a living? And he said, well, I do home rentals. I do, how much do you make? He told me, I said, stop doing that. We'll pay you the same to do journalism. And he spoke so clearly on terrorist attacks. And he's such an expert in the Quran. Not only has he read it, but he's published an annotated version of the Quran. Don't try and don't try and debate the Quran or Islamic politics with Tommy. You'll lose. He's he's a master of it. He was invited on Piers Morgan's show, Good Morning Britain. Piers is actually fairly good on the issue, but he wants to distance himself from Tommy because Tommy's a ruffian. Tommy's a, a soccer hooligan. It was the most riveting. TV ever on Good Morning Britain. It was the highest rated show in their history. Why? Well, it was, it was gripping TV. But it was the first time mainstream Brits were allowed to hear a conversation about the elephant in the room. It was the first time people were allowed to hear someone talk about what's in the Quran and the hatred for infidels and, and to have someone speak without euphemisms. That's why that was a riveting show, the most popular in their history. When Tommy did a commentary immediately after the Westminster terrorist attacks, 20 million people watched it on various meetings within a week. And I managed with our team to convince Tommy that his past as an organizer was interesting, but instead of speaking to thousands at a rally, why not speak to millions on the internet? And we had a fruitful year together. This spring he decided to go independent. The thing about Tommy, he's not built for having a boss. Uh, we parted amicably, we kept in touch. When he was with us, we were always concerned about two things, his physical safety, he was attacked all the time. He's had to move. Police come to his house, he doesn't know if they're there to arrest him or protect him. Physical harm and legal harm, because the police, to the police, he's the easy way to solve a problem. If you have massive gang rape gangs, and you have one Tommy Robinson pointing at them. Is it easier to solve the problem or to shut Tommy up? And by the way, you put Tommy in prison, many prisons are run by Muslim gangs. Any one of them who would be a hero to the community for killing Tommy. So when he goes to jail, he begs to be put into solitary to save his life. And if the warden doesn't put him in solitary, that's the warden's way of saying, I want a permanent solution to the problem of Tommy. Let me wrap up because I have, we have with us uh, a representative from the office of Lord Pearson of Rannick in the House of Lords, and I'm going to call upon P. 
Peter McElvena to come forward to give a two minute update. So Peter, if you want to present to the AV team, they'll give you a microphone. I'm gonna call you up in about two minutes. Um, so last Friday, Tommy was outside the courthouse in Leeds. There was a rape gang inside, 27 men, two women who were colluding. Imagine that. You hear rape, rape in North America. A woman hears that, she's afraid, she calls for help. In this rape gang, they, they helped organize. They helped recruit. They helped cover up. Tommy's outside the courthouse. He's careful because we, he was arrested once before for this, so he was not standing on court property. He did not give out any confidences from the trial. He did not call them rapists, he called them alleged rapists. He was very careful throughout. When he read their names, he was quoting from the state broadcaster, the BBC. He did not give any confidences. That said, are you ready for the video? Do you have the video, Justin? Let me show for you. Tommy was standing outside the courthouse. <laughs> 